All right. This is On Fire Fitness. I'm your host, Mitch Stokes, and joining me today is Frank McDonough of Grass Hollow Archery Training Center here in Orangeburg, Pennsylvania. Say hello, Frank. Hello, Frank. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Frank, for those of you that don't know who you are? Sure. Um, I am the co-owner and founder of Grass Hollow Archery Training Center. Um, I'm a USA Level 3 archery coach. Um, I'm a full-time teacher, full-time archery coach, full-time bow technician because I'm the only person here to do it. And uh, we have some help elsewhere, but... Got to teach the boy. Yeah, yeah, he's learning, he's learning. Uh, he's a little young yet, you know, child labor laws and all that stuff. <laughs> but, um, and, you know, about three or four years ago, my wife and I, I came up with this crazy idea to try to grow archery in this area, and before you know it, we ended up in a 5,000 square foot facility. So, you know, we're doing our thing. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, and uh, for those that don't know, I, I've been watching Frank do this for the last couple of years, and it's it's been pretty cool to watch it. Everything progress from just a handful of hours, a couple of lessons over the evenings and weekends, and an old warehouse and a basement yeah. to a full fledged facility, training facility in here. I mean, he's got a shop in here. He's got an office. He's making T-shirts. He's teaching kids. He's taking kids to tournaments and doing really well. It's it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's 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 been a hell of a journey, and you know, it started. It literally started. No word of a lie in your second facility, um, and my reintroduction to a lot of what we're talking about tonight. Just the the performance aspect of yourself and having. Um, the enjoyment of mental anguish in some ways of training and and the realization that the body has to move and you have to be challenged and that you have to learn to be comfortable doing uh, or, um, uncomfortable things and uh, you know your venture into CrossFit and weightlifting is actually what really generated this whole thing because it reminded me what it was like as a competitor in archery. And that's uh, a little bit of what we're here to talk about today is that competitive edge, uh, being mentally prepared, the mind of a competitor, where an athlete needs to be psychologically in order to perform at their best. Okay. And uh, let's, let's dive into that. Just want to jump right in? Yeah, let's jump right in. Well, I mean, I guess there was kind of four things that we were going to touch upon. And, and uh, you know, the first one was just mental preparation and practice. Um, and, and, in working with you, working for you, um, you know, moonlighting as a weightlifting coach because of being a CrossFit coach, I won't, I'm, I'll never say that I was a legitimate weightlifting coach, but Lord knows I found that weightlifting, Olympic weightlifting to be specific, um, is super addicting. Um, and it's the, it's the mental challenge and, and good Olympic weightlifters are people who are, um, they enjoy the grind of trying to get better. Mm -hmm. right? They thrive off of it. They thrive off of it. And, Absolutely. And arch, you know, professional archers or archers of high high levels enjoy that same thing, you know. And um, really early on, uh, I learned when I, when when we when we as in fluid fitness, fearless barbell, dove into the Olympic weightlifting. And, and I dove into that as well as being part of your staff, the, the, that mindset came back full-fledged being, being on a platform. And then, and then taking seminars with people like John North and taking um, instruction from you and, and your weightlifting coaches that, that were helping you know a 30-some-year-old guy move better to to be able to hit specific positions to make a lift right mm -hmm. you know and then what what i have done now as a you know as an archery coach you know we have kids from the ages of seven to you know 16 17 years old here and we follow 
you know, for you, you follow USA Weightlifting. Lord knows there's tons of weightlifting opinions out there. And but, gurus you know, out bound. Yes, yeah. Well, and archery is the same way. Yeah, but same we sport. Have, yeah, but we have a system that we follow, and we follow the system at the Olympic Training Centers. It basically, for the most part, is is teaching. Imagine that. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, so we teach kids to move correctly with archery so that they can find success. You know, and the mental preparation side of that, first and foremost, before before we even dive into the things we do to mentally prepare them, the first thing is, is they have to move correctly. Mm. They have to be in the right positions at full draw during their shooting process in order to be accurate. It's the exact same with weightlifting. It's the exact same with snatch and pull Oh, jerk. that snatch. Yeah, that good snatch. Very little room for error uh, in that lift, and it, it, it is, it's a mind game. Mm-hmm. Some of the best lifters out there, I mean, they'll just have a session where they're just falling apart. You know, they're really trying and they just keep missing that weight. Uh, and then, you know, you drop back down. What do you work on? What does the coach tell you to do? To fix your technique. Yeah, There's something, you, you, the bar's too far away. Your your knees are coming through too soon. You're leaving your feet too soon. Back's not tight enough. Hips are rising too fast. There's all those little intricate parts because you're moving your whole body. The whole body is an implement uh, when you're lifting that barbell and, and when you're pulling and drawing that bow. There's a lot that comes into play. And it, when someone's learning the Olympic lifts or they're learning a new skill in general, mm-hmm. it can be really, uh, what's the word I'm trying to find? Like overwhelming. Monotonous, too. It's monotonous, but it's overwhelming. Like, mm-hmm. oh, my God, he just told me to keep my back straight. Now he's telling me to push my knees. Now he's trying to squeeze the barbell harder. What is this hook grip? Uh, yeah. Is a lot going on mm-hmm. in the mind. And, and focusing on that one thing at a time really helps, I think. Yep. When you're coaching a kid or yep. coaching an athlete in general, it doesn't matter how old they are, give them like one, two things here. That was really good, but I want you to do this a little bit better next time. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. And and you were talking about lifters, you know, where they get like a, they hit like a block. You know, you, you hit a block where you just can't hit the, hit a lift. You can't hit a weight. And you know how when, when we would be going for, and not that I don't, we're going to dive into archery stuff quite a bit, but. You know when you're you're going for a PR and it's a training PR, and it's mm-hmm. literally a half a kilo, and for some reason, <laughs> for some reason, you have this mental block that you can't hit this lift. You yeah. just hit, just for me myself hypothetically, I, my my best snatch was a hundred kilos ever, mm-hmm. and say I was going for a, you know, a hundred one, and I had a half kilo each side, whatever. Yeah. If you can hit 100 kilos, you can hit that half kilo or that full kilo, li- that next lift. Absolutely. There is nothing holding you back. and, and yeah, It's not your deadlift strength. Yeah, it's not. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and in archery, what we run into, and I, I say it to myself all the time as a mm-hmm. competitor and as a coach, if I can shoot three X's in a row in the discipline that I shoot, I can, I can do it 60 in a row. But mentally, I have to be in that moment on every single shot just like you know on the platform we have to be in the moment on every single lift and and pr- preparation for that is is where the you know the part where we'll talk about mental preparation and practice and like what i do in the archery world and what you can do in in the fitness world per se for a, a you know an olympic weightlifter that's training youth adult or otherwise whatever so with that introduction i guess i don't know <laughs> that segue yeah yeah i mean there is a lot to go on it and we've always talked about the similarities and you know there are differences but it goes into a lot of the skill sports when you talk about oh, god recent recent guy tiger woods yeah he'll never win that guy will never win again he's done he's a mental head case he's not tough enough to come back and what did he do he did it yeah. in in the face of all that negativity, all the things that went on in his life. He came back and won it. Yeah, and and all those years, that foundation of of his game was it really hard for him? Was it as hard? I think the mental part was probably harder for him, or well, or despite injuries, I think looking outside of injuries, distractions. Yeah, and then to come back 
and have the mental prowess to be like, you aren't going to stop me. And that that comes a lot, I think, from his father. Yeah. Uh, who, those of you that don't know, he was Green Beret. Yeah. Uh, and he used a lot of the coaching philosophies, life philosophies, if you want to call them that, ethos of the Green Berets, of the Special Forces, raising his son and, and, and really teaching him how to block all that out. Mm-hmm. And I think what happened to Tiger happens to a lot of people that become successful is they get overrun with distractions from success. Yeah. And he definitely was a victim of his own success, and it took him a while to, to pull himself out of that pit. Yeah. And I think it, when you're in that situation, we've all been in that situation where oh, things are just not going <laughs> really well. I didn't make good decisions. Things are falling apart. You have to rely back on that that lesson that your dad taught you when you were like seven years old, eight yeah. years old, 12 years old. You're like, okay, I'm just going to put one foot in front of the other and I'm going to ignore what's going on around me. I'm going to focus and get in, you know, where people talk about that, that flow state where there's nothing else in the room, mm-hmm. but the target, there's nothing else in the room, but the barbell, whatever it is you're doing. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you know how, you know how when we're, when we're in that mind frame, we have that, like the, and, I'm going to refer back to John North again, where he talks about like the barbell is like your enemy of sorts. I'm going to, <laughs> what is it? I'm going to slay the dragon. I think. Slay the dragon. That is, 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 a, is a John North, John North term. You know, in, in the archery world, the shooting line <clears throat> is a very, very lonely and dark place. The competition line specifically, but practice just the same. So, you know, what you need to do is you need to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Neat. <laughs> I literally just shot a video about being comfortable being uncomfortable. I swear I didn't see it. Freaking yesterday. I haven't I haven't aired it. It's for oh, tomorrow's I, I, food for thought. Yeah. And for those of you that are listening, I, I do a food for thought on YouTube every Friday. I will be moving it to the podcast instead. I just find it's it's kind of cluttering my YouTube. Yeah. And cluttering the gym's page. People are there to work out and lift barbells. They don't necessarily want to hear my, you know, thoughts on life. So I'm going to move it to the podcast. <laughs> no, but still, yeah, you should. That's, I, yeah. But yeah, that's you have to be. You have to find a way to be comfortable being uncomfortable mm-hmm. in, a, in a competition format. Oh, you got to deal with the anxiety, the self doubt, stress, self doubt. You know, um, on the spot fixes when you mess up. Mm-hmm. You have to be okay with failing. Mm-hmm. And in order to succeed, you have to be able to, I just flubbed that shot. I need to put the next one in the middle. Yep. That one's over. It's over. This is what I did wrong. Let's move past it. Or maybe you don't know what you did wrong. Yeah. You don't, know what you do. Yeah. Then you go back to focusing on your form. You go back Focus to on what you know. Your, your process, your process thinking, okay, this is what I need to do. This is what I'm going to do. And it's over. And yeah. like in, in, in practice or in what we do here, you know, like and I'll give you an example. My my compound shooters, they all all of the ones that are shooting competitively, they have a release pouch on their on their on their belt. And one of the things that I teach them is that you must put your release in your release pouch. Now, there's actually rules in some formats that you have to put your release. You're not allowed to leave it on your bow and stuff like that. But the kids who are shooting at the higher levels, you know, I make them take the release, put it in their pouch before they, and, and, and also teach them to take a nice big deep breath before they even put a new arrow in. And the reason that I have them put the release in there, that's like them cutting off that last shot. And I tell them all the time, like in the indoor format, there's, we shoot 60 arrows at a target, an X the size of a dime. Obviously the mm-hmm. target's bigger than that, but there's no mental grind in archery that's worse than shooting 60 arrows at a, at a dime sized target it's, it's, it's the most I've ever done Frank is maybe 30 or 40 arrows and that was like I'm really into this right now yeah, <laughs> yeah. meanwhile last weekend I hadn't shot in like a month and I shot um, I think ballpark like 200 and some arrows because we had a bare bow kind of training tournament going on here and and I was shooting and I'm, <laughs> on Sunday like my shoulder was like oh and then anyway, I ended up shooting Sunday anyway, just a couple arrows, but, um, but just getting back to, to what I was saying, you know, I, I tell, I tell my, my shooters 
and I, I don't constantly throw out social media and people I tell them you aren't shooting 60 arrows that day you're shooting one arrow 60 times you need to separate every single arrow you need to think about the process you need to think about being in the moment and if you're if you're being analytical and focusing on the results downrange if you're focusing on in, in, in weightlifting you're fo- focusing on the weight that you have on the barbell if you're focused on the lift that you want to hit on your third lift and you're not worried about your first lift it's not going to go very well for you yeah we oh god who was it there was a track and field coach when I was in high school he, and I'll be able to figure out who, who said it. Don't look at the finish line. Stop looking at the finish line. Look past it. For several reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, looking past it's one thing, but also, you know, you, you come out of the blocks and you put your head up right away and you're standing straight up. Yeah. And no good. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you want to stay low, out of the blocks, mm-hmm. coming out fast. And, you know, kids look at that finish line. Oh, God. You can't look at it that way. When I, when I ran track for the same high school back mm-hmm. in the day, um, you know, I remember uh, a coach telling me. Who Brian, was it? Brian Miller. All oh, right. And it, it, about my gaze when I'm jumping. Don't mm-hmm. look up in the air. You yeah. Know? And I go to, and here's just a funny side story. I go to my nephew's track meet the other day, and he's a jumper, ironically. Runs in the family. But <laughs> he was doing long jump, and he would go, and he would take off. See him running down. He'd slow up right before he got, and he's only in ninth grade. And his head would go flying back as he's jumping. Uh, I'm like, I'm like, listen, the quickest way to the ground is for you to look straight up or straight down. I'm like, yeah. you gotta, you know. And we 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 went through. I remember just being in that moment. I was like, oh, I remember this conversation well, that's, so many years ago. It's eight to twelve pounds of ballast on the human body, and and depending on where it goes, it's gonna dictate where the rest of your body kind of flows to. That's right. They say it all the time in wrestling and in football, where your head goes, your body follows. Archery is the exact same way. Yeah. So, you know, and I have that conversation often online about, you know, about form and, and, um, you know, there's, there's this idea, there's a lot of old school mentalities in archery, which is, I, I, there is in weightlifting as well or anything else that you do. Oh, absolutely. But there's these old school mentalities where, you know, you gotta, you have to really get into your anchor and you need to do all these things and. Meanwhile, the national training system basically it's it teaches simplicity. Mm-hmm. You know, less is more. The less yeah, yeah. we have to repeat, the easier it is to repeat. You know, repeatability is built upon step by step. Let's just get to the point. Let's do yep. exactly what we're supposed mm-hmm. to do. Let's not sh- use extra muscles that we're not supposed to, mm-hmm. and let's just focus on using putting our body in the right position to use the correct muscles. Use your prime movers. Right. Because yeah, they're the ones that will last 60 arrows. Exactly. Yeah. I know. Imagine that. And we have this carryover from a completely different sport, mm-hmm. but also, you know, an Olympic sport. Yep. And for now. For now, right. Well, archery is pretty popular right now. I don't foresee archery having any issues in, in the Olympic ranks. But, you know, and it's just, it's I, it's crazy to me how in order to be comfortable mentally you have to establish those foundation of movements first you know what i mean yeah and it just always relates yeah i mean less is more when you over inundate the athlete with a bunch of cues like no at once it's terrible yeah we'll get into Uh, that a little bit puts a kid in a head case but Doing the repetitions, doing the monotonous things, you know, as yeah. far as preparation yeah. is you rely back to your training. What is your training? What did your coach tell you? And, and coaches, you know, this this shows for you too. You know, stop saying so much. You don't need to give feedback every shot. No, uh, If you're giving, you no, know, like, hey, shoot five, shoot ten. Okay. That was pretty good. You don't have to criticize and nitpick every damn repetition. And I, it drives people nuts. Sometimes it makes it uncomfortable that I don't give feedback sometimes. Yeah. How was that? I'm like, I don't know. It was your first deadlift ever. Give me 10 more. <laughs> I could tell you what I'm really looking at here. You know, Once isn't enough. It's just like doing a study on something. Mm-hmm. We only observed that once. It's an anomaly. Let's observe it 20 more times, and then maybe it's an actual pattern. Yeah, that's you know? exactly right. And, 
we we there's a time and a place for for that analytical coaching too you know you do that 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 the feedback you provide a lot of that in practice in head in in face to face contact in private lessons or private sessions you oh, yeah. you get you provide that stuff then but what i see is oh in the archery world i see a ton of over coaching on the competition line oh yeah like hey if he doesn't know it by now or she they're not going to know it now. <laughs> Stop over it. You, you don't need to write a manual. Like, yeah. and, and sometimes it's almost like a, you can get in the trap of like almost trying to impress people with how much you know. Mm-hmm. But really all they need to know is mm, like like in a lifting meet. Uh, my brother, we were at the Arnold a couple of years ago. And I, haven't, I hadn't really coached him in forever because he was lifting with John Zajac for quite a while. Mm-hmm. We got out to the Arnold. He asked me to count for him. We're out in Columbus, Ohio. I'm dead from... Eating Quizno subs on the turnpike gave me really bad uh, food poisoning. It was like the worst food poisoning of my life. But long story short, you know what he said? He's like, all I need you to say is chest up, head up. Yeah, Chest up, head up. Mm-hmm. Like, that's all I need. Don't tell me keep a flat back. Don't tell me keep the bar closed. Don't tell me all this bullshit. Yeah. Tell me head up, chest up, because that's like the, his biggest problem at the time. And he did really well. That's all he needed to do. And a lot of times it's all when you're on a competition line, especially a big one, where yeah. the more you tell them, the more anxious you're going to make them. Yeah, absolutely. I see um, – and we're like – we had this mental preparation, state of mind with the competitor, all stuff. We're completely have blown that out of the water at this point. But, mm-hmm. you know, it, the, the, the agenda we were going to follow. But, you know, I see parents and coaches and they're, they're – their child, their shooter, even an adult shooter, they're standing on the competition line. You see them make a shot. First thing they do is they whip their head around, and then they want to look back at their yeah, coach look. or their parent yeah. or whatever. And either they want, was that? they want to know where the arrow went, or they have this this look of disgust on their face. And I actually yell at my son. I don't yell at him. I take that <laughs> like, back. hey, stop that. I tell him, don't look at me. If you're focused on what what my reaction is to your shot, you're not focused on your shot. Yeah, you should be following through. Look at, look at the target afterward. Yeah. Like, take a breath you know, after you shoot. Let the bow down. Put all your that release stuff. in your pocket. Yeah. Take a breath. Forget what just happened, whether it went in the middle or it went yeah. where you didn't want it to go, and do it again. Look at you know some of the best shooters in the world in the military. Like you're not taking a marksman's course like in the infantry taking a shot looking up at the di was that good yeah. no you're gonna shoot repeat shoot repeat and he's gonna come around the firing line going you're doing this wrong fix okay. this move your foot yeah you know whatever readjust your cheek weld it you, these guys aren't looking cut and we're, we have the best the brain corps is arguably the best infantry in the world right. um for a reason because it's repetition repetition and they're not looking for constant feedback. If you're getting constant feedback, <laughs> there's a problem. Yeah, there's definitely you're a problem, problem child. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and if you're constantly seeking that feedback, your concentration is that's an insecurity. Yeah, your, your concentration is the wrong spot. Your concentration needs to be in that moment. I mean, mm-hmm. and, and and maybe there's a case where you're not the coach or the relationship between you and the athlete where they just. They need that feedback, and if you're not willing to give that feedback in some in some ways, like you have to get that message across. You need to concentrate on you. When you're in that moment, your mind has to be on what's happening in in, in that process, in that present process thinking, where you're you're thinking about the process, not about the results at the other end. The task. You're not concentrating. You're not concentrating on the weight that's on the bar. Mm-mm. You're not concentrating on the lift that's the following lift. And and I I swear that that's why competitors in the weightlifting world miss their first lift mm-hmm. because they're thinking about their third lift already. Oh yeah, and then, what if I miss this? <laughs> what yeah, do I do then? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All the aftermath. I had a lifter. She was difficult. Uh, Mentally with that, why she gets scared of weights. Like, oh, I, I've never done this before. You know, that that's two kilos more than I've ever done, coach. And finally, and she was a talented athlete, springy, just naturally fast, mm-hmm. good kid. Uh, I actually, 
I said, all right, you're going to turn around and sit down. You're going to face away from the platform. It was this number she was just afraid of. And I loaded her barbell. And when I was done loading it, I didn't tell her what I put on. I put my hands over her eyes. And I've never done this again because afterward I was like, mm, maybe that was a little excessive. Yeah. <laughs> but it worked. I, I covered her eyes, walked her to the barbell, kept her eyes covered, placed her hand. I told her, place your hands on the bar. Feel for it. She's like, well, I can't see. You don't need to. You've taken thousands of repetitions with this damn barbell. Put her hands in the exact right spot they needed to be for the snatch. It was a snatch off the blocks. Makes it. First try, I said, now open your eyes, look down at your feet, then you put your head up. I don't want you to look left and right at what's on the bar. Don't look at the weights. Go. She did. She snatched a, a lifetime PR at the time. You know, she was like 14, 13 years old or something yeah. like that. Yeah. You know, 45 kilos, it, it, it was like around her body weight. She was a tiny kid. Um, sometimes you, you have to be more, like you said, focusing on the task, the process, the mechanics. The, the technical things yeah. that you need to do, like first I do this, then I do that, yeah. and now I'm going to go, and I'm going to do it. Not, well, what happens if I fail? What happens, um, you know? Who cares? Yeah, exactly. Move no one's going to lose their mortgage over it. <laughs> Move on. <laughs> Usually. And do it again. Yep. Move on. There's always another arrow. Do it again. Mm-hmm. And and I say that constantly. We, we do a drill called blind bail. And, and and archers across the world do it's not a hidden secret it's nothing major but our kids shoot blind bail and it's part of their programming it's part it's actually it's a it's a, a piece that's built into the program that they shoot every single week to help prevent the that mental break that happens in archery it's called target panic it's one of them but it's it's you know and it's, it's like that, quicksand. Yeah, oh, it's it, it really is. And then they fall apart and it just gets worse as the session goes on. <laughs> and like, oh whole, no! Well, and in, and and in some ways, lifters lifters hit that same thing. The target panic is that it's that fear of not making the lift. Yeah. So they just sabotage the entire thing mm-hmm. because they're like they already have it convinced in their head that I can't do this. I'm not going to make this lift. Yeah, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. And then yeah. that's it's in some in some ways there's a similarity the other way is that target panic in in the archer world is is generated it manifests in two, in kind of two ways maybe there's a multitude of ways but one way is them being in the wrong position they're being in the in their they're biomechanically in the wrong position at full draw mm-hmm. and then because they're under tension just like in weightlifting when you're yeah. under the barbell or whatever you're under tension when you start as soon as you pull the the first pull in either lift you're you're under tension there's that fight or flight response of this isn't right this sucks it's not gonna work you need well, to it's go it's counterintuitive to yeah. go underneath a heavy snatch yeah like well, a human being your natural inclination is well that sounds dangerous yeah so we tell an archer yeah, I want you to yeah. fall, draw a bow back and you may only be holding mm-hmm. 15 20 maybe with a recurve 40 45 50 pounds whatever and we say relax pull it back and relax be in the process be mm-hmm. in the moment yeah and and it really again it's counterintuitive well when you shoot a gun you are you're you're not under that same tension but yet we're so finesse on the trigger and sure yeah. if we're shooting at a human body or especially if you're laying you know, prone it's so easy yeah exactly but in in archery we're under that tension yeah and if we're not if our body's not in that right position well, what we want to do is, is we want to get rid of it. Our body, we can put up with it for so long. Mm-hmm. You can, and and I'll snatch is a perfect a perfect um, example of this. I can use my strength to blast through a, a plethora of lifts. Yeah, I'm just gonna drive my legs as hard as I yeah, freaking can, I'll mindlessly. Yeah, I'll get it. Holy like hell! But then when you get to that ninety percent plus capacity of what you're actually able to lift. Mm-hmm. Of as per your strength, two things take over. Yep. You're not going to hit that lift if your form isn't right, yep. if you're not in the right positions at the right time, and if mentally you're not there. Oh, it kills me. When, it, when I'm going over a barbell movement uh, and we're warming up with a bar, whether it's a group fitness class, doing a snatch clean, jerk, whatever, or one of my weightlifters or football players, and well, it's just the bar coach, so I was moving slower. Like I didn't have to move that fast. I'm like, I get it. But you have to understand, if you don't move correctly, 
and with the proper aggression and timing with 100 pounds on the bar, 300 pounds on the bar, it's not going to happen because right. you're not like, – and I just stopped. I stopped a group. Uh, I think it was a varsity team one time. I was like, guys, this is how a warm-up should look like. It's brisk. It's aggressive, but it's technically sound. Everything's in the right place, and I did a couple sets in front of them. I was like, this is what it looks like. Yeah. And I've, I've had other coaches like Nikki – um, demonstrate while she's working out next to them. And uh, they're like, oh, that's how you're supposed to move with the bar? I'm like, yeah. yeah. Like, if you don't do it now, what makes you think you're going to do it with 300 pounds when your brain's going crazy? You need to have it drilled into your brain. It's it's a drill. Yeah. It, you know, we get into this rut of, well, it's just practice. Mm -hmm. And then what, what happens is, is we go to a meet um, or we go to a competition for archery and you know, in you know what the chaos is like in a weightlifting meet, uh -huh. and there's platforms everywhere, there's weights dumping everywhere, you know, and kids use, missing and crying, and yeah, the coaches yelling. Yeah, <laughs> you you just described an archery tournament. Can oh, you see dude, exact, kids kids will miss a target, and it's the end mm -hmm. of the world. And they're I've seen kids get upset and they're crying, and, and most of the time it's the parents, it's the parents that are oh. pushing or. Or a coach, you know, in I've some regards. I've seen it both. I've yeah. seen some stuff They're, that I don't where like. The, the anticipation of performance is, you know, you have to do this. And and they have that, you know, whether it's I invested the money or I invested the time or whatever, you need to you need to make this happen. And it's just that attitude that, <laughs> listen, I'll, this is what I'll say. I, I watched my 12-year-old shoot with target panic for over two years. I blame myself for his target panic, which is why I have dove so head over heels into how do I fix this? Mm -hmm. What did I do wrong as a coach? And what did I do wrong as a parent? And you know what it was? It was too much, too early, too fast. Yeah. I mean, that, that can happen. I got a kid and there's always that kid, man, he's, awesome uh -huh. look at him move he's almost six feet tall and he's only 14 beautiful he moves beautifully he listens he does everything you ask um real easy to coach and and then they have a bad session and then you have to remind yourself oh he's 14 he looks like a young man and he may be really talented but at the end of the day, they're 14 yeah. their brains all over the place their mental focus is all over the place they're going through puberty. Yeah. They have things they're thinking about. Um, their body changes, mm -hmm. limb proportions change, mm -hmm. all that stuff. And then you add in something in the mix like, my dad's the head coach and the owner of the facility. Yeah. I mean, even if you don't put pressure on a kid, like my dad never put pressure on me for athletics. He could care less. Mm -hmm. He did athletics, but he's like, if your grades aren't good, you're not playing. I still put pressure on myself. What if I fail? What if I suck? What if I don't get a starting position? Like I put pressure on myself because, you know, it's a father son thing. I think, yeah. you know, it's tough. Well, and I, I think I never accounted for what was developing. Um, I was a, I was an immature coach who was just kind of going off of the feel of what I had done in the past. And it wasn't until I got my level three and I worked with my mentor coach who I, to this day, Larry Wise is my mentor coach. You know, he even, now that I'm a barebow competitor, you know, he, he kind of, I feel like he stalks my Facebook page. And if I post a video, <laughs> I've got a message from Larry. He's like, send me that video. And he'll send me that. And, and just the impromptu, you know, this is what I see. And, and I trust his word. Like it is, yeah. you know, um, written in the Bible because it, and, and, it's because not just his experience, but like he authentically believes in the same system. Now, yes, I came from that system, but mm -hmm. you know, it's like, a shared philosophy. It is a shared philosophy. It, it, I mean, he's a, he's a level four coach. Yeah. He coached at the Olympic training center. He's coached some of the best young competitors mm -hmm. literally in the world. Yeah. And you know, it, what I learned becoming, uh, educating myself as a coach is that you know my my son has drawn years ago he would I put him in the wrong positions he was a growing young shooter and if you can't just let a kid shoot at the same draw length and not expect things to happen if if as they grow in the last two years 
he grew my son grew four inches in a year that's ginormous and, and he's not that's a huge fast. kid but he grew fast yeah and what do i have to do well i gotta keep up with those changes so that and and i finally started paying you know i paid real close attention to that and all of a sudden as i kept up with those things that were going on you know his target panic this anxiety of of the shot anticipating the shot it, it has started finally to i'm seeing it go away it started at like nine years old he just turned 12 wow that's how long he's been but i didn't push i didn't push the competitions i didn't push the winning no that's the worst thing you could do and the the next thing you know, he's burnt out and he just doesn't even want to touch a bow anymore exactly. find find the fun make it fun despite the conditions don't be worried about them winning or losing. And, and and you know, I'll be honest with you. After a tournament, if he didn't shoot great if, or if he shot great, just tell him, hey, I'm proud of you. That's it. Or, you know, and that's not necessarily a mental thing. I think that's a mental thing for parents and coaches to be able to be like, listen, I'm still proud of you for being here. You didn't – you're not getting a participation trophy. No, but you came out here. But you came out here. And it that's takes guts. the person who didn't. Hell Yeah. And that's what I tell people when they, when they tell me, oh, I'm so pathetic. You know, it's like the first couple of weeks in the gym. Yeah. I'm so pathetic. I can't believe I'm so weak. I can't believe this. And well, like, you know, you're starting from square one, man. Like, give yourself some credit. You're here. I, I tell them, like, you know, you're here and your buddy's not because he's still hung over. <laughs> and he smoked a whole pack of cigarettes and then right. ate, you know, a bunch of sheets food afterward. And you didn't. You're here. Because you set up an appointment at seven o'clock in the morning, and you got your ass in the gym, and you're doing it. Yeah. It's, an, it's not an overnight thing; it's a process, and that's what's great about it. It's a beautiful thing to watch someone transform like that. Yeah. But people are really hard on themselves. Yeah, it. You know, we don't. We learn not to be hard on ourselves when we learn to accept the failure, though. When we learn to accept the thing. Listen, the, I made that mistake own it and it's hard it. to do you know for super an, hard to even do for it. an adult i think it gets and harder as an adult kids to do it i know <laughs> we expect kids to do it well you know what uh, we do i was wrong what we do with our practice like the mental preparation of our practice and i remember i, I used to giggle about this when we would be lifting in a session at, at uh, as part of fearless you know we would have six platforms around and you know, some, oh, the little laundry room thing. Uh, yeah, you remember yeah. that? That was and fun, though. It was fun, but I used to I used to laugh at people who got freaked out over like if the music stopped or if the it was in between songs or if you walked in front of their platform and stuff. Yeah, you know, I mean, and I know there's like lifting etiquette and there's yeah. archery etiquette in yeah. in. Um, Don't walk in front of someone when they're taking a shot. <laughs> yeah, all that shit. <laughs> but you know, I used to giggle about it because, like, in the archery world. If you watch like world archery competitions, and we have archery etiquette where you're, you know, somebody's at full draw, you're not supposed to, um, you're not supposed to walk off the shooting line while they're at full draw and stuff like that. And you know the thing, the thing that I laugh about the most is that you watch these world archery competitions, and they shoot their arrow, and boom, off the shooting line they come. And in America, like God forbid, if you do that. We were at a state tournament just a few weeks ago, um, and my, our son Evan was shooting, and a young man next to him shot a shot. Evan drew back. The kid turned around, looked at him at full draw, and then they walked off the line while he's at full draw. And he saw it, and he came back, and you know he wasn't upset. He was just perturbed, like, well, apparently others don't learn archery etiquette. And he said to me, I said, well, you shouldn't have seen him anyway. And he looked at me. I was like, <laughs> I said, I said, if you saw him walking off the line your full draw, the your head wasn't in the game. Mm -hmm. And he was like, and he just looked at me, shrugged his shoulders, like, yeah, you're right. You know, and I do that here with our kids. You know, I play music loud. Yeah. Or it'll be dead silent. Mm -hmm. You know, here. Vary the environment a little bit. Yeah, all, all the time. Um, you know, I, I kind of personally, when depending on, I picked a situation, I'll walk off the shooting line here while somebody's at full draw. Not because I'm trying to be unethical. It's because it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It is going to happen mm -hmm. in a tournament, in a tournament process. Yeah. You know, and it, if, and if you let that screw you up, it's because you're not in that present, present process thinking. You're not thinking yeah. in the moment. 
you're worried about other things and mm-hmm. on the on the how many <coughs> excuse me <coughs> Ooh. you know in a couple of weightlifting tournaments I've gone to with my daughter man I got like a frog in my throat <coughs> excuse me Frank. that's okay Frank. you clear that throat a little uh, bubbly helped a little bit there um you go and you see you're lifting in the back room or you see people on the uh, on the on the platforms practicing their lifts and you get out and then all of a sudden it's silent on the platform and all these people are staring at you talk about opposite environments you hear the stuff in the background but you don't really hear it no you get out it's like you're underwater as soon as you get out on that platform for the first time and you you go down you put your hands on the bar and then your coach is like and you know your first position is, you know, all right, well, hips up, chest up, and you and your gaze all of a sudden goes to it, and these people are staring you in the face. In archery, <laughs> in archery, it's the same thing. Yeah, you know, you go out, you stand on the shooting line, and you're all of a sudden you're there, and it's just you. And then before you know it, two minutes runs off the clock. You have thirty seconds left on the clock. You still have to shoot an arrow. All these people walked off the line. And, oh, man. and there's, you're the last there's, guy. There's a thousand people shooting on this line. Oh. You're the last person. You got 20 seconds ago, and you have to put an arrow in the middle. Where does your mind need to be? Stop thinking about the time. Don't think about the time. Draw how you need to draw. Take your breaths. Execute. Go. Yeah. Execute. Yeah. Just, just execute the shot. I think that's my favorite cue. I use the most is, all right, go. Yeah. Pull. Yeah. Go. Absolutely. Like stop thinking and just go. I mean, it's just, and and like I said before, I'm pretty sure I, I, I said this earlier, the archery line in competition format is a lonely, lonely place. Mm-hmm. You have to, it's, it's you. You have to really love it. It's you and what's going on in your brain. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Platforms, the same thing. Quick story about the uncomfortable... And this, this this goes for the coaches, especially youth. It happens more with the youth. I don't want to sound harsh because people do push kids too hard in the wrong areas. But at the same time, they coddle them in, in areas where, hey, this is a moment for them to grow a little bit. Mm-hmm. As soon as it can get a little too hot, a little too cold, a little too tired. Oh, we swore from yesterday's practice. Okay, I understand that, but guess what we're practicing again today and so is everybody else Mm -hmm. um they really hamper the kid's growth they hamper that kid's ability later on developmentally psychologically i'm talking clinically when they're adults or when they're adolescents it carries over into their young adulthood Mm -hmm. when there's a conflict when they're uncomfortable with something something, the first thing they learn to do is go around it go the other way quit find a shortcut Avoid the situation. Mm -hmm. Um, It's terrible. Mm -hmm. When I was a young sailor, I was in Coronado, and the class behind me when I was at Bud's, there was a gentleman. He was, was, I want to say older, but like I was 19, so he was probably maybe 28 years old. (laughs) He was like an old man. Right? (laughs) um, Pappas was his last name. Petty Officer Pappas was in the class behind me. I watched him go through Hell Week because I was a brown shirt rollback and we do like support. We get make sure that they're hydrated throughout Hell Week and all that. And I watched him go through Hell Week. The guy made it through Hell Week and he was having a really hard time with running. He couldn't breathe. He just felt tired of that. He had a partially collapsed lung. Oh my gosh. You know, and, and yeah, we're not all going to the military I understand that, but there's a character builder like that guy's life. Nothing ever is going to be as hard. Mm-hmm. Nothing as shitty as things can get, as rough as the competition line can get, and, and other things in your life, and this is where sports psychology carries into the rest of the kid's life, yeah. it's never going to be that bad. You know, because you've come over that adversity, and, and it's different for everybody. Maybe it's not as extreme. Maybe it's just something as simple as, oh my God, I bombed out on Snatch. My coach and my dad, instead of telling them, like, well, you can just quit. You know, there's no point because you can't put a total up. Screw that. We're going to go out and lift because you're good at cleaning jerks. 
We're going to put, we're going to lift the weight. You're going to make a damn lift while we're here. You're going to do it. You're not quitting. You're not running off the platform just because it doesn't count for anything technically. Mm-hmm. You're going to do it. And a lot of parents and coaches go, well, you know, he's tired and this and that. And, like, and there is a, a line within reason where, yeah, you don't push past a certain point. But if we're too afraid as a culture in this country and in the Western world in general, we've gotten softer. We're too afraid yeah. of making people uncomfortable, especially when they're children. That become soft. Uh, they're mentally weaker. They don't know how to cope. They lack coping skills. Later on in life, with uh, they don't want their boss. They are, are having problems in their relationship. You know, workplace, co-workers that they don't like. You're going to work, people. You're going to work, kids, if you're listening. If any of my high schoolers are listening to this, because I know they are. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, they, they stalk the hell out of my stuff. Then they, they comment on it, like, hey, Coach Stokes. Yeah. Um, you know, guys, your coaches, they're not being a dickhead. They may seem that way. They're stern. Yeah. But you have to remember, they're trying to... It's not about getting scholarships all the time and winning medals. They're mentoring young people so that they have the life skills to cope with those difficult situations because you're going to have a boss that you don't like. You're going to have a coworker that you disagree with and you're just, oh my God, I can't stand this person's face, but you know what, i got to work with them. Mm -hmm. And and we have to be on the same team and you have to learn to deal with that. And being in sports at a young age I think is great for learning those social skills. And learning to deal with distractions psychologically, like, hey, can you get out on that line and miss a couple of times? You know, you know what? Well, I'm going to move on. I'm going to concentrate. I'm going to focus on the process and execute. Yeah, and the, in, in the professional archery world, you know, there's a bunch of different disciplines of archery. There's, you know, there's this men's open where they have, like, oh, the best gadgets, and they are shooting perfect scores every competition. You know, the amount of pressure, you add money into it. You add professional, you know, where these guys are living. There's only, in all of the professional archers in, in all of archery, there's a very small percentage that are truly professional and they're living off of it, right? Those are the guys who are really under pressure. So they have to hit that dime at 20 yards indoors. We're just using mm-hmm. that as a as the, you know, our, our example the margin they, of error is really small. Super small. Yeah. And if they miss that X, they it miss that small little little dime sized target. Yeah. One time, they're probably out of the money. And they can't think about that. And they can't think about that. No. So that's where that's where you see like your top mm-hmm. performers are the people. They're not thinking about the X. They can shut it off. They're thinking about being in the moment and making the shot happen mm-hmm. the same every single time. And you know, and I switch so. And I guess one of the reasons I've dove into this, and, and I switched three different disciplines in the last three years. And I shot that men's open, you know, I shot that style, and then went back to Olympic recurve, which is uh, is the style that you see on the Olympics on television all the time. And that's isn't that how you learned? Originally? That's how I learned yeah. as, a, as a as a junior Olympic archer development shooter. Started out with a compound, you know, really really young, and then by eight or nine years old, started Olympic recurve. And I was a really good youth, uh, a well above average, you know, pretty solid youth shooter, top three in the country stuff, you know, around my preteen and teen years. And I switched as an adult and as a coach back to Olympic Recurve because I wanted to grow that side of my team. I wanted the, my kids to see it happening, you know, and, sh- and, and, and Rob Koffel recognized that he's been, he's the owner of Lancaster Archery. He kind of supported that endeavor. And then this year, I, and I had a really good year as a as a renewed Olympic recurve competitor, and good enough to you know be like top uh, thirty in the country for indoors last year. I don't remember what I what, what I had finished and um, switched to in August of last year. I switched to competition barebow, and barebow is probably one of the most it is the most difficult competition class out there right now and that's you know shooting the olympic style recurve but with no gadgets no sights and you're really just relying on form and um 
Ment- it's honestly a, a lot of me- the mental process, the 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 process, um, present process thinking of avoiding the target pain, avoiding the body's the body's um, signal to say you got to go, go, go now because you have to be able to be again being comfortable, being uncomfortable. Yeah, you got to ignore that fatigue. It's so hard. You have to get over it. Th- yeah, yeah, you have to. So you rely on 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 the body. You rely on the yeah. body being in the right position all the we time. We do that. I'm, oh God, I'm I'm trying to think of sport we don't do that that I've coached. Yeah. Football. Uh, Coach Schiffer from up in Myersville, he loves doing this to a kid. And like in between squats, like, hey, I want you to get down in your stance. No, that's not a good stance. Get in the stance. Okay, load your hips. This is where I want your feet. This is where I want your hips, your shoulders. This is your weight displacement. All right, stay there. And the kid thinks, well, I can stay in my stance all day. And then they're shaking. Yeah, within a minute. They're like, less than 20 seconds. Yeah. You know, and it's like being able to hold that position. We do pauses at the knee, at the mid shin, high exactly thigh on thing. snatch and clean and jerk. Uh, pausing the dip on the jerk. That's a mind screwer there. <laughs> but uh, you have to be okay with shutting it off. I'm like, I'm in a good position. It doesn't matter that I don't get to move it and get that stretch reflex. Mm-hmm. I'm in a good position and I have good technique. Go. We do we do these these little skill drills in archery and our practice is called draw holds. The kids absolutely hate them, but they have to hold them for varied amounts of time and they'll they'll do one where they draw back and they hold the bow for a set amount of time. And then they they learn to they have to let down under stress. So they're tired and fatigued. And they have to let the bow down to keep slowly. Them. And keep it under control. Yeah. Imagine that control. Yeah. And and they do all these things. Every time I program them and I write them on the dry erase board, I get these looks like you got to be kidding me. We have to do this how many times? I'm like, what is this a CrossFit class? Yeah. It's exactly, <laughs> oh, the irony in that statement because it's kind of what it's de- designed to be behind. You know, it's not. It, I guess it is kind of constantly varied, but it's constantly varied with a purpose. So you know, it's it's. There's some they write in notebooks every single day. So yeah, there's there's some things that have carried over from coaching CrossFit. There's no doubt, but it's it's just it's funny to see, and it works. It works. You know, mm-hmm. strength don't... and position, strength and position. How strong are you in that position? Can you hold it yeah. under duress, yeah. and then execute your your movement? Yeah. Absolutely, definitely. Not just let go of the string. Go, oh, I'm so tired. Yeah, coach. Let go of it and collapse. That burns so bad. Yeah. They, the um, the thing I've noticed is that you have to find a way, like with our program, as far as the coaching concern, and the the varied ages I have from eight years old to sixteen, seventeen years old, is that you have to try to find a way to keep it fun and entertaining with all of them, and and still build that foundation, and still build the foundation. So you know, and the kids love shooting novelties they love just having open range nights and stuff like that but you know they don't realize that on those nights a lot of times i i i'm constantly watching them from afar or even up close and i'm watching the the finite details the draw length issues do they need changes is there something going on with the bow i listen you can hear you know within a shot or within the bow itself if there's something not right, especially with recurves. But you know, I mean, there's just there's so many ways for coaches to keep it fun, keep it interesting, but make sure you're still building upon the foundation that was started. Oh, absolutely. You know, we we have a ton of kids that shoot recreational. You know, you're not going to get a lot of kids that are that are going to do weightlifting recreationally. You might get them to do it for fitness, but not like just for fun. You know what I mean? Yeah. We do have that in archery, and those kids. In, in some manner get treated the same way I'm building the foundation right because you never know when that light bulb's going to go on true and they're all of a sudden going to be like you know what I kind of I kind of do want to go to my first oh, competition absolutely. that's how I treat uh, any of my athletes that are coming from yeah. a sport program like the football team yeah those, those varsity kids you know I, I grabbed a couple more yeah I could be lazy with well, well I just that's good enough that's good enough of a snatch no way because Next thing you know, the kid's moving so good. I'm like, oh, my God, you're going to do a meet. And I got a couple of kids from the varsity team and the junior high team signed up for a meet. They did great. Yeah. You know, one kid, three months of training, and he clean and jerked 105 kilos as a freaking sophomore. 
is he by any means like a national qualifier? Is he going to go medal tomorrow? No, but... No, but in two years he could be. Yeah, developmentally, I mean, he could be really far along, and that's only going to help his football playing. I'm really excited about watching some of these younger kids go through this program mm -hmm. that we've been doing since, God, we only we started in December. I think he's power clean to 110 kilos. He doesn't weigh that much. He's not a huge kid. Uh, but vast amounts of potential, and there's a lot of kids in there like that. And, and I would have done a disservice to him, his team on the field, mm -hmm. and myself and the rest of the club if I just like, well, you know, he's just a football player, so who cares what his clean looks like? <laughs> That's BS. Yeah. You know, no, I, I get he's using this tool for another means. He's not going to compete necessarily, but he still should move good. Yeah. You know, why should he move any less – with any less quality than the rest of your competitive shooters, you know, when you're talking about shooters, exactly. it's no better compliment than when someone comes into your gym or someone comes into your training facility and see your eight year old, your twelve year old, your forty year old shoot and you go, Wow. Hey I, Frank, I gotta tell you. Pretty nice, pretty clean looking shooting. Yeah. That's very good, very, very sound. And, and same thing when, when any of my people go somewhere else, they go visit a CrossFit affiliate or something like that mm -hmm. on vacation, mm -hmm. and they get nothing but compliments. You move really good. That's a nice snatch. That's a nice clean. That's I've a good squat. I've, I've Hell been yeah. at one of your uh, as one of your athletes. Mm -hmm. I've gone when I went to CrossFit Reston for for my level one in CrossFit. When I've gone to uh, I think CrossFit the Swamp in Massachusetts, I went with Jade. Um, I think is it the swamp? I think pretty sure that's what it is. Um, was it hot in there? It was really hot, actually. I'm trying to. It remember. gets humid up there during the summer, like New York and in Massachusetts. Yeah, oh, yeah, it was. It was. It was, it was like June. God. And but we went over and and um, got the same compliment. I mean, they said they knew I was a level one because they asked if what kind of experience you have, and. But even Jade was doing uh, her weightlifting because she was in your weightlifting program at the time. She was doing her weightlifting in the corner, like, "Hey, I just want to compliment you guys." You know, you can see when you when you build the foundation right from the beginning. You don't. It, it makes life easier as For it gets, everybody as it gets harder. Yeah, but Absolutely. you but but you have everyone has to be on the same page and everybody has to be all in. You oh, know, yeah. and I'm gonna. This is probably outside of the mental talk, but you know that falls back on parents. I also there's also the flip side of that where I've had a parent, you know, talk about, you know, they they were searching for something else, or they didn't like they didn't like that idea of you know accountability for for the shooter in some ways, and they want that. It's got to be intense. It's got to be, it's, there's something, there's, there's, you know, what, and, and looking in the youth, what does a, a six year old, an eight year old, a 12 year old, is it about intensity at that age? Or is it about, first of all, being, learning to become a better person than what you're trying to do? Mm, absolutely. You know, or, or they're or, learning how to learn at that age. Yes. It's like kindergarten, first grade. They're not learning how to do arithmetic, really. They're learning how to stand in line, wait their turn, raise their hand, yeah. sit nicely, don't be rude. Social skills, again, social skills, right. and you know, be uh, fair play, mm. big sportsmanship. Oh, dirty word. Yeah, yeah, right. Sportsmanship, folks. Teach your kid to be a gracious winner and a loser at the same time. They lose. You have to learn you know, how to lose before you can appreciate winning. And I, I gotta, I gotta talk about this. Um, I went to the Hershey uh, Giant Center yeah. this year to go watch the state finals. Uh, actually, I didn't watch the finals. I watched the semifinals and the quarterfinals. I think for wrestling. Oh, okay. For PIAA. Mm -hmm. I went down with the head coach Ross Myers, mm -hmm. and it had been a couple. Of, oh, God, probably a decade since I watched the state tournament. And I looked at him, hey, you know, it's been a couple bouts. I'm like, Ross, is it me? Do I have rose-colored glasses? Or do the kids of yesteryear, they didn't win and then flex in front of the damn crowd? <laughs> like, call me old school. It, 
it bothered the hell out of me. Yeah. You could tell it bothers the fans. You could tell it bothers the officials out there. But like, what are they? Everyone's doing it. Yeah. That's yeah, the culture we're living in. Is I'm gonna throw this kid to his back. You know, win by six or win by one doesn't matter. I'm gonna flex in front of a crowd. Yeah. I hate it. There, I, listen, there's, I, I, there's nothing wrong with being exuberant and excited and, and jump up, scream, you know, and being but, scream your head off. Yeah, but I mean, don't show us how badass you are, you know, because show us how hard you worked. Yeah, well, I mean, a little emotion is good. How, no, we know how hard you worked. Oh yeah, you're in a state championship. Yeah, we know how hard you worked. We yeah. don't have to prove it to us. Yeah. But if a, if if a, if a kid wins, and the official steps in and puts his hand up, and then he goes over and shakes his opponent's hand and shakes his head coach's hand, that's not showy enough anymore. Yeah. When did that become not enough? And I had nothing against celebrations. Yeah, celebrations. Are you know, fine. the kid is athletic and he wants to do a somersault in the middle of the mat afterward and put his put his hand up that he's number one because he just won the state finals. Hell yeah. I love seeing that kind of stuff. I like seeing the emotion, the excitement. It's not yeah. supposed to be, a, you know, like an intimidation. Uh, yeah, and it's not supposed to be uh, a funeral parlor either. Yeah, you know, that's one thing. I, I, some sports I, I can't stand, especially weightlifting, and it's turned around over the last five years. Yeah, I felt like you were at a funeral. <laughs> okay, there's the golf clap. Yeah, well, that's and that was that was a uh, weightlifting kind of. We have the same problem in, in American archery. You go to another country or watch some of these, like uh, the competitions in Nimes or in, in in Rome or any of these other countries, and they have they're making noise and they're celebrating in general. Like that's just, but for some reason in, in archery or in American archery, and it's been improving dramatically mm-hmm. in the last couple of years. You know, they're like it's like dead silent. It's that Anglo-Saxon ancestry bleeding out in the still. That's exactly what it is. It's incredible, <laughs> and that's that's improving in the American archery. But and and it's gotta it has to for and this is way way off base, but it has to for American archery if we are to survive and maybe even make it to like mainstream television or for us, it's got to be exciting. So there's nothing wrong with excitement and and being proud and but at the same token like we don't need to be what's the word obnoxious yeah obnoxious is good yeah exuberance great happy yeah. you know smile dance break dance on the mat yeah. <laughs> i don't care yeah. break dance on the platform yeah. just don't be obnoxious yeah. don't be disrespectful to the other po- your opponent you know because really Especially in the weightlifting community, I've seen two two different polar opposites. I've seen people who are like that, mm-hmm. and then I've seen people who are exuberant, but happy, and gracious. And they go back in the back room, they high five each other. Hey, that was a really good lift, man. Congratulations, you know. And they just got beat. Congratulations, like that was something else. I, I liked watching that lift. You really held on it. You fought for it. Good for you. Mm-hmm. Best man won today. Best woman won today. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with that, you know. Not at all. It's, but again, you know, going back to our conversation about how you train, you know, train so that you are duplicating as best as possible the environment you're going to compete in, and that you don't know what that you go down to the American Open and it's loud. There's platforms everywhere and there's weights slamming everywhere, you know. And next thing you know, your hands are bleeding. They're feeling dizzy because you just cut 34 pounds over the course of four months. <laughs> exactly. But then you go to a local meet yep. and there's like 25 people in front of you and it's you can hear a pin drop Ugh. when – you know what I mean? Could touch you can a, hear a pin drop. Touch it's like a gonna, string. Exactly. And we run into the same thing in our in our format. And yes, you got to mix it up. What we're doing a lot of right now is – and I run this thing called Online Archery Challenges where people shoot live on Facebook. We've been doing it since 2015. I like that. Yeah, and I did. I was thinking about this today, just in, in preparation for our conversation. Imagine if you went on Facebook Live and had your lifters lifting in front of people that are peers. You know, and I was funny. It's funny because I I did one the other day, an online tournament. I did it on the GHA page, 
and I was talking to uh, the one of the founders of something called the Push Archery. They're like a big traditional bare bow archery, you know, uh, brand. And I told him, I said, I, I was doing this Facebook Live um, for this tournament, and my mom, I'm 41 years old, my mom logged on to watch the Facebook Live. You know what? That made me more nervous than anybody. Like, it could have been anybody else could have logged on. And I was Hell like, yeah. But you, I'm just saying, and it's just, again, it's it's all part of that. What we the very I think the very first statement of this podcast, being comfortable, being uncomfortable. Oh yeah. My dad watching something. Any of my coaches that like mentored me as a kid, mm -hmm. if they're around, it makes me nervous as hell. <sighs> my brother, my baby brother. Yeah. Because he is. He's got a mind on his head. Uh, that melon of his is just full of it, uh, knowledge. Yeah, uh, he's a big thinker, but uh, it's, especially with the weightlifting and the human movement and stuff. Um, I'm like, ah, what is my brother gonna think of this? Hey, was that good? He, and when he gives me like the fist pound, like, yeah, it was good, man. I'm like, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't think I was an idiot. Yeah. Uh, but to get into what you were talking about, like replicating the stuff that happens in competition. So lately, what we've been doing is time sets on snatch and clean and jerk, uh -huh. uh, and we're, we've been building volume on this. Their capa their work capacity is, is been going up every weekend, but hey, it's the end of the week. We're going to replicate competition. We're not just going to have a max out session. That's easy. Anyone can sit there and do heavy singles. You're going to do an EMOM at eighty yep. percent, and then once your heart rates up and you're tired and you're fatigued, but you've built that technique, drilled it in. Now I want you to go for a heavy single. Yeah. We just did five. Same thing with clean and jerk. Well, I'll give them a little bit longer rest. We'll do it every two minutes on the two minutes with the clean and jerk. Same thing. Five of them. 80% minimum. Now let's max out. Next week we'll do the same thing. And then the next week you're know, like, hey, it's not five, it's seven. Mm -hmm. Hey, it's not seven, it's nine. Now we're going to do ten. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're, we're going to have to cut it off at some point because we'll just kill the kids. Right, right. But – we're going to tail off a little super compensation where we deload. We drop down the volume over time mm -hmm. over the next couple of weeks leading up into the national meet. And, hey, because stuff happens, you miss an opener. Yeah. And, uh, you know what? It was there. It was a goofy miss. We're going up anyway. You're going up anyway. We're going up five kilos. We're going up ten kilos. We're going to take a lift in the back real quick in 30 seconds because there's a second coach going to load it for you. Go now. I don't care if you're tired. And you need to be ready to go because they're going to call your name up in like a minute and a half. Yep. And you need to be able to do that and be confident doing it and know that you can handle that stressful situation, not only mentally, but physically, your, your condition for it. I, it's funny that you, so you kind of referenced periodization. Yeah. With, with your training, mm -hmm. right? And I've, I implement that into our archery program. Hell and yeah. So, oh yeah, absolutely. Especially before like big, big tournaments. Taper. Taper. Yeah, taper. It's, so, explain in the weightlifting, in, in the training of, of doing the Olympic lifts, what is important about tapering, say, the week or two before a big meet? Okay, so training fatigues. The whole point of training in any sport, really, is to fatigue the body because you're inducing a stimulus on the organism. When we come down to the science -y stuff here, we want to get the organism to adapt, mm -hmm. as in change, mm -hmm. like grow more muscle tissue or get faster neurologically. They're more efficient with, with the lift or, or you're talking about a sprinter or whatever. Mm -hmm. They get more efficient. They don't even have to think. They can have their eyes closed. They do it. They do it fast. They do it well. But eventually, you have to start dialing down the volume. Keep the intensity high. Right. Well, the loads, because if you if you step away from intensity too much, you rest the athlete too much, uh, they get weaker. Right. So you have to continually squat, front squat, back squat, high pulls, things like that. As it gets closer to competition, volume is almost completely dropped. It's minimal because they're resting. Mm -hmm. And then about a week, week and a half before the meet, they feel like shit. Their body is just out of whack. Their body's like, what's going on? We were doing all this work. Now we're not doing this work. What the hell? Mm -hmm. And then it rests. And it has like a weekend of rest. And it comes back the, the week of the meet. Monday, feel a little bit better. Still don't feel that great. Tuesday, feel better. 
Wednesday feel better and doing right. a couple of light doubles or something like that, doing some openers. Day or two before the meet, they're almost like they're jumping out of their chair. Like I wanna, I wanna lift heavy. Yeah. I know it's good. Yeah, you're rested. Exactly. You're rested, and you're at your peak strength. You're peaking right now. You're rested. And you're at the strongest. You're at the fastest. Neurologically less fatigued. Mm -hmm. So that when we show up Saturday or Sunday morning, whenever lifting time there is, they're ready to go and they're at their peak performance mentally and physically. Yeah. There's a couple of myths in the archery world that you just need to shoot big volume and that's all that matters. Shoot lots and lots of arrows, right? It's every sport oh is like gosh. that. It's the shoot old way of thinking. Of, or, or I got to be tired. If I'm tired, then neurologically I'm not gonna. I'm not going to be overwhelmed, right? And and there's this thing, I, and I, it's funny because in preparation for this podcast, I posted in the one group, and I remember the one shooter. He's been here a couple of times. He posted like he, you know, his his thing is he shoots when he's tired and I, for competition. I'm like, and, and I, I didn't go in any detail, and and I'm, and knowing Bede, he'll probably listen to this because um, he's just that type of mind. He wants to know things. He's 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 interested in in just details. He works in the medical field. Like, it's a future coach. Yeah, oh, I would say so. And, and I that's don't know where it that starts. Well. That's where he's, it starts. If they have a natural area, curiosity absolutely, yeah. in something like that, they want to know the inner workings. It's mm -hmm. not like challenging you. It's like, well, I want to understand what's going on with myself and my yeah. training. That's a good sign. that, that And it's not – they don't have to be the best athlete. We talked about this last night. Uh-huh. Well, with the other podcast with John mm -hmm. about just because they were a good athlete doesn't mean they'd be a good coach. Oh, for sure. You need to have someone that's analytical, yeah. that understands processes, and has a, a yearning to learn like that beyond their themselves. They want to mm -hmm. know, well, why do we do this, and how does that work? Yeah. Um, and and someone that doesn't get enough credit is some of the high school coaches when we talk about tapering and and they understand how to not fatigue an athlete two opposite ends of the spectrum you have parents that see their kids lifting weights and like eh, he looks like he's standing around and lifting weights he's not sweating really that much yeah he's not working hard he's enough. not working hard enough i have and to so, shoot i have to shoot a hundred arrows yeah. a day mm -hmm. because that makes that makes uh, that i'm working hard and, and that's going to make me a better shooter but yet my movement patterns suck or mentally I, i'm not in the where i need to be so what am i reinforcing Yep. I'm um, either I'm reinforcing bad bad, bad movement or if I am in the right position mentally I'm in a shithole. Excuse my <laughs> language, sorry. Uh, um, this is not FCC regulated. Okay, I dropped the F bomb last night, so don't worry about but it. But I'm saying, you know, I, I'm 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 concentrating on the wrong things and I'm just shooting a whole bunch of volume so then come the week before a tournament, I'm still shooting, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of arrows. Going into the tournament, I think I'm I'm gonna be I'm and I'm gonna be top in, at the best of my ability neurologically. My system is gonna be recovered all of a sudden. Hell I'm gonna no. be no, you're not. You're, you're fried. You're you're fried. That's right. You might shoot okay. Yeah. You might you might do well. Yeah, the parents want to see their kids fatigued. If they're sweating, they're jumping up and down, doing ply box mm -hmm. till you know half hour straight, doing all kinds of goofy stuff on the on the speed ladder. And there's time and place for that stuff. I do plyometrics. But I don't fatigue them because they get slower. They get sloppy, and then they get at risk for injury in the middle of you know, a set like that. And then you have a coach that he's been in the system for, God, 25, 30 years. He's been coaching since, I don't know, coached me. He's still coaching track and field. Uh, he'll, he'll tell the kids, guys, rest is important. No, we're not going to go that heavy. I actually want you to get a lighter implement today, and I want you to throw X amount of throws. And then done. I want you to stretch out, go home, eat some carbs, drink some water, recover. get some sleep, and recover. Because yeah. in the next couple of weeks, we need to be ready to peak for this big meet. Leagues is coming up. Districts is coming up. States. Track and field athletes, if you're listening. Your coach isn't a bonehead. Just because he's older than you doesn't mean he's not in tune with what's best for you. He's been coaching that long. Yeah. He's seen it all. I have that. I, I ran into that a couple of times where you know our kids will shoot big volume, you know, certain a prescribed amount of time before a tournament, and the week before, all of a sudden it dives off. It dives off a little bit, and they, and we're doing some fun stuff, and they're doing blind bail, and they're like, "Well, why is this all we're shooting? This feels like it's not enough," you know. And I and I just 
good. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, and I, I, and I and and I want to say it means your work capacity is up, and it's good. We want it there. You want to yeah. be here. You want yeah. to shoot. It's not a matter of you know. And I, I have, I see. I see it all the time. I even see it online, and I do some online coaching, and I do some online video analysis and stuff like that. And I, you know, oh, I shoot X amount of arrows per day. You know, I'm good. I'm used to it. It's not a matter of being used to it. It's a, it's a matter of a letting the body neurologically recover, letting the body mentally recover, and the desire to want to be there, mm-hmm. the desire to want to be in that moment, the drive. When the drive is, if it's not. If you're not in that, I, okay, I've been, I'm here all the time. This is what I do. You're not, there's no drive. To no, you're like, that. like you said, like, oh, I can do, I can shoot more than that. Good. You, you're like, you want to be here right now. <laughs> That's where you want to be psychologically when you show up for competition mm-hmm. or even training. Sometimes I understand that there's training days. You're like, oh, I just don't want to be here. I'm so tired. I got other things going in my life. And that's, and you push through that yeah. so that. And then when you do taper and you get in that state where you're like, I want to be here. I'm so psyched. I feel great. Mm-hmm. I'm jumping out of my pants. I mm-hmm. really want to lift weights right now. That's where you want to be. Yeah. You absolutely. don't want to be like, oh, I'm so tired. My hand hurts. My knee hurts. My back hurts. I'm so tired. I didn't sleep last night because of my anxiety. Yeah, I don't even feel like lifting today and I'm at a national meet. Yeah. That's not the place you want to be in. Yeah. And then, and then, then that's the moment where – because mentally you're recovered, because physically you feel good, and because neurologically you're recovered, you step up to the competition line, and all, all of a sudden... Your very best. You're your very best. You Better have, than you've ever shot. You have the ability mm-hmm. to concentrate on being in that that present moment. You have the ability because you're just you're firing at on all signals. And you know why? Because you rested. Because you had, because you recovered, and because you took that time to just concentrate on those finite details. Because, and I think it was Travis Mash that I that who was a weightlifting coach, obviously, which most of the people who listen from the fitness side are going to know who he is. He had said should should if they don't, yeah, right. Um, you know, when a when an athlete is at ninety percent or better of what they're lifting, there is no coaching to be done. When they are at their peak performance, there's nothing that there's really, and I don't, not this isn't verbatim, but what are you going to do for them at that moment? They have it. Can't lift the bar for them. You can't lift the you bar. You can't for shoot them. the target for them. Yeah. You can't. You can't throw that pass for the kid. No, that's right. You got to. You got to let. Yeah. You got to. You have to create the environment within their training so that they can perform as good as possible. But what's more important is that they have to. They have to understand what's going on behind it, why they're there, and 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 be okay with. Listen, you got to fall back on the process. You got to fall back on your form. You need to fall back on everything that you've learned, and just make it happen. Do it. Go. Frank, what do your notes say? Because I know we we we're, we've gone on a tear. I do. I don't want to miss things that we were like looking forward to talking about. With you. I think we covered almost everything. Yeah, I mean, just a little organically. Yeah, for the most part. I mean, it's just there's one specific. Um, do it. There's one specific quote in here that I wrote down. It's the mental break comes from having an analytical, conscious focus on the results and not the creative feel process. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know. So I just got done with uh, taking a course in uh, writing in the social sciences, right? You got to cite everything in APA format and all that nonsense. But if you focusing on, oh, God, if I'm going to mess this up, I'm going to get a bad grade. And, you know, it's going to affect my GPA and uh, it's going to affect my post-grad stuff. You're missing the point. The professor wants you to write content, meaningful content, meaningful research content on a subject matter. He, you know, he allows you to pick something that you care about. It gives you a broad, a general outline. Like I want you, it's, it's an argument or this one is persuasive or this one is a critique of a study. I want you to critique a study. Pick any study you want, critique it. If you focus too much on the end result, like am I going to get a good grade on it? Where's the soul in it? 
there's absolutely no soul in just focusing on the end result all the time. Like I gotta win, 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 win. It, part of the part of the beauty of being involved in sport in in, in your life is the process and the struggle of getting through each day and getting through each session and, and getting something out of it rather than we're focusing on a year down the road constantly. Yeah. Yeah. Focus on, on the next step. Focus on the next arrow. And the now. And the now. Be in the moment. Be, Absolutely. Be in the moment. It's... Man, I can't, and, and it's so hard to get that across to kids, but I mean, I, I, honestly, it's hard to get across to adults too. Well, everyone is so, myself everyone's so di- distracted all the time, and we're all guilty. Mm-hmm. I've, I've made a rule every once in a while, like, you know, going to dinner, going to lunch with somebody, whatever. It's Whether it's with my four-year-old, my girlfriend, my parents, a co-worker, whatever, we're hanging out, or I, I just put the phone away. I leave it in the truck. I don't even put it in my pocket. I leave it in the damn truck. I'm jealous. <laughs> like, like, just gone. Like, uh, yeah, I own a business and I got to be on social media and all this yeah. crap. But you know what? Mm-hmm. Do I really need to know how many likes I got off that advertisement yet? Yeah. I don't yeah. need to know yeah. right now. It's okay. Yeah. And, that's a whole other. That's a whole other podcast. Oh yeah, how about it? <laughs> but you, uh, you know, the kids are they're all over their phones and all that. And I'm mm-hmm. like, guys, get off your phones. Unless you're using a calculator to do percentages, mm-hmm. put it down. Mm-hmm. Go put it away. I don't want to see it. I'm going to like drop a barbell on the damn thing. There's so many distractions in our culture nowadays because of our technology is so handheld. Um, being a teenager, teenager is probably harder than it's ever been. I can't and even and I, it, it bums me out. And I do, I get annoyed with some of the, the culture changes. Like, come on, guys. Like, it's really not that bad of a practice. You guys are all soft millennials. But at the same token, I, I get irritated when a coach or a teacher or a parent, well, you know, these kids these days, yeah, yeah. they've been saying that forever. They said that about my generation. They oh, said yeah. it about yours. Oh, yeah. You know, hey, everything's wrong with the next generation. Oh, I don't know what's wrong with them. Well, you guys raised us. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's but fault. <laughs> here's the thing. They're a victim of their circumstance a little bit. Yeah. You know, we raised them and we they were born in this world where everything's handheld. Everything's available to them right away. I mean, can you imagine going through high school and having Google, Wikipedia? Mm-hmm. Like, you don't ever have to set foot in a library if you have a handheld electronic device mm-hmm. that has access to the internet. You don't even need to go to a library. Life is easier, but it's harder at the same time. On top of the normal stuff of being a teenager and being an adolescent, and you got you got. Girl troubles, boy troubles, whatever. You know, bad grades. Your parents are hounding you for this. You didn't do your homework. Your chores are messed up. You got to feed your dog. Your goldfish died. Your little brother's bugging you and won't stay out of your room while you're trying to do your homework. And, and you're an athlete. Yeah. A three-season athlete on top of that. And you got to hit the weights. And then you got to have good grades because everyone expects the best out of you. You have to be perfect all the time. Mm-hmm. Not only do you have to be perfect all the time, but you have to take pictures of it. Yeah, and post it on social media. And you have to take videos of it. And and everyone's got a camera out at all times. And I feel bad sometimes. I'm like, oh, my God, it's so cute. My kid's doing this thing with her friend. We were at Niagara Falls a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing the pictures. I was trying to keep them occupied because we were waiting for the bus. And they were going kind of crazy. You know, they're four. One's four, one's five. Best buddies. And we're up in Niagara. And the bus on the Canadian side runs really close to the falls. And there's this big courtyard, like grass area. So I was like, Hey guys, we're going to have races. Do you want to do races? And, uh, cause my buddy had to watch the younger son. He's only like three. He just turned three. So, you know, you know, it requires more attention. You can't just have a three year old just walking around the streets. Don't here. miss it. <laughs> it's a lot of work. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to take care of the girls here. And just keep them occupied with their foot race. And they started at one tree race to the next tree. We did it over and over and over again. And, and after about the third or fourth time, I'm like, out of reflux, this is so adorable. There were, Niagara Falls in the background, and the kids are running back and forth doing foot races with each other, smiling and laughing. Yeah. I, I took a picture, and I took a couple of videos. Yeah. And I'm like, after a while, I was like, is that enough? Like, I, I'm going to put the phone away. 
you almost feel guilty about it. Like, am I that, am I that person that has the phone out all the time? Yeah, but at least you were taking pictures and videos of kids playing in an amazing in an amazing moment, and you weren't looking and you weren't sliding down on your phone to refresh Facebook no. and see what your notifications were. No, that's where the disconnect is, and this is nothing to do with what. Yeah, your gratification. We, we started this. Podcast Did I get approval? For, but, did I get yeah. approval? What's well, yeah. psychological? Did I get it approval? It is psychological. Yeah, there's a well, lot of dopamine. You know? Okay, you so know? approval, the instant gratification, the instant approval that people need through social media. The kid on the firing line turning his head around right away. Oh, that's exactly Coach, right. what do you think of that? <laughs> I need instant approval right now. Mom, what? What? What did? You, what did you think of that shot? Or, yeah. Or oh, the shot didn't go in the middle, and now I'm. I'm sad and depressed because it didn't go in the well, middle. Well, you got Tell athletes. Me. Athletes tell me what went wrong, why the lift is still going on. They do the pull and then they stop. And they, oh, that wasn't good. Well, Finish it. I don't care if you miss. Don't be afraid to miss. Yeah, miss. If you're going to miss, where do you miss? I like missing behind. Miss behind. That means you went for it at least. Yeah, at least you pulled hard. Don't enough, give up. Right? Don't yeah. just stop I mean, it and Clark I'm, it. Hey, man, I've been there. I've, I've been there. Oh, I Clark. I Clark shit. I haven't clerked things lately because I don't push myself that hard lately. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you're now running a podcast and a business and have a family and going yeah. to school almost, you know, it's that. Well, I figured it'd be a little easier to, you know, train for things that are a little simpler and less, a little less technique involved. Yeah. I'm going I'm to do a triathlon, a sprint triathlon in September. We have fun with that. It's short. <laughs> it's like a 5K run oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then a short bike and, yeah. you know, a little swim, like... Compared to what I did when I was younger, I'm like, yeah. nothing. Only thing I want to do is I want to go to London, Kentucky, if possible, and do 3D Nationals, which is, it's the it's the team trials for the U.S. archery team. I've never team. been to Kentucky. Yeah, well, I wouldn't looks go to pretty. Kentucky either outside looks of pretty. hunting and something archery related, but... You know, I, that's 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 kind of like that. Maybe outdoor nationals, hopefully, and um, uh, I want to go get my USA Archery level four, hopefully in the fall. Uh, but I have to go. How many levels do you guys have? We have five. Whoa, what's and, five like? International coach? Yeah. Well, level four is technically international coach. You can, oh shit! You can travel with the team if you're. You know, there's a hierarchy there, and I'm not sure how the whole thing works, but. I'm sure you got to produce to athletes go, and all yeah, that stuff. I have yeah. to go to the Olympic Training Center to get my level four, and then which is in which is in Colorado Springs. Okay, and then actually I might have to go to Chula Vista. Chula Vista, yeah, you want to go to Chula Vista? I think I have to go to Chula Vista for for the you, level four. I'm not 100 sure where that's held. If you go to Chula Vista, I get some restaurants for you. Yeah, I may have. I, however, there's also a coach symp- symposium that's. Um, that might be at the at, in Colorado Springs. I'm not 100 percent sure on that either, but I mean, those are definite goals. I have no desire to go for my level five. There's only a handful of those, I believe, in the country. Um, level four is where I'll probably tap out. And if honestly, if I don't know it by now, then you know I'm not sure how much more there's. Really, it's just at this point, the concentration is on what the goal. Is get to level four and then and, and be as educated as possible as I can, so that I can then in turn improve and have better athlete development and mm-hmm. make sure that I'm I'm giving these shooters I work with and I'm friends with multiple college coaches. I want to see GHA produce opportunities for kids to become collegiate shooters and eventually get into the professional ranks. That'd be awesome. That's all I want to see. That's what I want to see happen. That's what I want this to turn into a funnel for kids to pursue a career in archery. Um, you know, maybe get college scholarships, shoot. You think the family saves a little money because the kid is doing something they enjoy. That's great. Well, there's a, it's the college archery was never really a thing unless there was it was a small thing. It was a small it's like a community. club sport. Yeah, for the most part. I mean, but that's changing. That's changed a lot in the last yeah. couple of years. And unless you were really, really deep into archery, you weren't necessarily like on top of it. And the reason we run things the way we do, where our focus isn't sales and all that stuff here, is you know are these other shops, these other places that might have teams. No, they're really still focused on that. Yeah, they have their programs and they do their thing, but they're not. They're not, it's not about, not, I want to say selling the education, but essentially I guess that's what it is. So what you do in fitness, you, you're selling your knowledge. 
Yeah. And you're you're changing mm-hmm. people. You're helping people. Develop. Yeah, we're not selling access to the facility. Yeah, no. That's 24-hour fitness. That's, you yeah, know, you want, exactly. Planet Fitness, whatever. Yeah, exactly. It's renting space. So we're developing, we're, we're trying to, and this thing grows, and, and, and we're, we're, you know, we're It's like taking pain. a college course. Yeah. You know, I, I show up at the time that they tell me the courses, the instructor's going to be there, mm-hmm. pay X amount, and the course instructor has a litany of education yeah. and experience teaching this specific area of expertise, this study, and I take the course and I, I get something out of it, I take a test, and it moves me on my way to segue to the next thing that I'm going to study. Yeah. You know, it prepares me for the, the next level. Yeah. And you, I'll tell you, you've seen you've seen athletes come and go. Oh yeah, that was probably one of the biggest adjustments for me. That's here. hard. It's yeah, because you get attached. You, you're like, I want to get this. This kid know, could do so good. You know what their potential is, but at the same token, it's okay. Yeah, and it's, it's not for everybody. Well, no, it's okay. No they can go wherever. It. Yeah, it's okay because maybe you were part of getting them started. Yeah, you and maybe it wasn't archery, and maybe it wasn't Olymp- Olympic weightlifting. Maybe, maybe it, they did the Olympic weightlifting for a while, and then you know, through the gamut, they met a buddy, and they got them out for the wrestling team, or yeah. you know, they got involved with whatever, like a youth group or something, and they really enjoy it, mm-hmm. and, and you know, and that's you were matters. part of that journey. Yeah, you helped get that started. Yeah. You provided an opportunity, an educational environment. You provided an atmosphere. And if a, a facility, whatever, that helped get that started. And then, you know, certain certain athletes are going to love that, you know, that relationship's going to be there. Things are going to go awesome. And then certain ones, you, maybe you're just not the right coach. There's moments where maybe we're just not the right coach for that. Athlete. Absolutely. Spe- it, specifically at the time in your life, you talked about being an immature coach. Yeah. Every well, coach has been it. every coach has been an immature coach because that's yeah. when you first start coaching. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You learn you learn by tr- trial and fire and failures, right. and you're like, mm, I probably wouldn't do that again. But there's even moments that as we progress and, and dare I say we venture towards becoming veteran coaches or senior coaches, that you still make mistakes. You say, not me. I never make mistakes. Yeah, you're full, full <laughs> shit. Yeah, you know, but you you make mistakes, or you yeah. you do you do something, say something, or or maybe push a little too hard, or maybe not enough. There's, too hard, too soon, not enough in the certain areas. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's all relevant, and it's it doesn't matter what the sport is, and it doesn't matter what the you know it, what the endeavor is. You you have to find that happy medium, and and for some kids, you might find it the right time. For others, maybe you won't. Maybe you'll find it at all for certain kids because you don't know what the expectations are of that athlete or or you don't know what the expectations are of the parents. And if oh, that's another rough one. Oh, that's a whole other podcast too. Parents, stop leaning so heavy on your children. Let them have fun. Yeah, let them have fun. Let them enjoy it. And later on down the road when they're a junior, senior in high school and they want to specialize in something, <laughs> I think we had a show on this already in yeah. this very room. I'm having deja vu. Yeah, well, that was my podcast. Chill out. But I don't do it anymore. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's exactly what, that's that's what it was. That was, uh, oh, man. Or no, I think that was your. That was a live feed. That was a Facebook live feed. Yeah, it was like, it was like last summer. I think yeah. it was almost a year ago. Yeah, but it's it's that, it's relevant. That's that's another podcast. That's yeah. a whole the parenting an athlete or something like that would be a. Well, I have a feeling we're going to make another visit down here. We're actually at Grass Hollow Archery Training Center right now down here in Orgsburg. Frank, before we part, I want to give you an opportunity to talk to people. And, and Where do they find you? What do you do? Why should they come down here to see you? Listen, Grass Hollow Archery is an archery training center for, for the <laughs> recreational shooter, for the bow hunter, and for the competition archer. Um, honestly, we have a very unique facility where you can shoot indoors all the way out to 40 yards. We do all of the necessary bow work, but our bow work and arrow work is custom. Um, we, we, we don't thrive on, um, we don't care what, what bow you shoot. We don't care what type of archery you shoot. You know, we provide an environment and a place for people who love the sport or maybe want to learn the sport to go and, and get exposure to it. Um, we're located at 1022 Chestnut Road um, in Orangeburg, and you know we're right now we're open in the evenings and on the weekends full time. But the because my wife and I both still work full time and and run a business full time as well. So 
But this summer, we plan to expand on those hours quite a bit. And like I said, if you're serious about either wanting to learn archery, just take it on as a pastime, or if you're a bow hunter and you're really serious about bow hunting, you want to be more serious about bow hunting, or maybe you have a, an inkling that you want to try the competition side of the sport, which is really what we focus on, you know, this is a place for you to go. It's pretty awesome. Thanks, man. I wish I had more time to spend here. <laughs> You're a busy man. You don't want this summer, maybe. Why not? Hell yeah. Well, why, I, not? I think, why not? I think so. I think so. I think you should. I think you should try the the, the traditional archery slash uh, um, that bare bow thing that I'm doing. I think that's what you bear should bow. do. Yeah. You know me. I like to shoot fingers and all that. Well, and that's what that's all I do now. Yeah. I don't know if I'll ever hunt with a compound again. So. So those days something are you said much about over. about stripping it down to the very like you said bare bones like here's a barbell here's your feet here's your legs here's your hands go make, make it work you know you don't need any sleeves you don't need mm-hmm. all this stuff enjoy the struggle I learned yeah. to enjoy the struggle I Absolutely. enjoyed I honestly enjoy the I, struggle and I think in that way people benefit when they go back to mm-hmm. something like like going back to a compound after that I think well, they benefit it makes it easier. It oh yeah, like this is makes, great. Look at all this it stuff. It makes it a ton easier. You know? It's I used to think that Olympic recurve was like super, super hard. And and don't get me wrong, it, yeah. it is compared to shooting compounded, it is hard. But man, when you take away all the extra stuff and you make it about your body and about your mind control and about your ability to relax under stress, man, does it change your outlook on, on what you're doing and it makes it fun again. It's almost like meditation. I don't want to get too weird, touchy feely, granola. No, no, with it's, people, but it's it's, it, it's, it's, feel, it's like meditation. Yeah. It really it's good for your mental health. Listen, there's there's proof, uh, and I have a young man that's here, um, and there's there's research that that's out there, meta research, meta, but it's it's research nonetheless. The young man that's, that shoots here who has epilepsy. No kidding. Um, yes, he started really really young and. And what he, he or he that came up really really young. He came to do archery because he couldn't play any other sports. Wow! I didn't know he had epilepsy up front. His parents didn't tell me, um, but we come to find out that he did, and he was still doing really really well. But we we learned. I don't know how we are on time, but I'll, I'll try to make this quick. Oh, we're fine. Um, he he started shooting, um, and. You know, we're shooting compound where you have like peep sights and pins and you have to aim and you do all that yeah, nonsense. Yeah. And, and it was going good, but you know, you could tell like he just, he would phase out. Stress him out a little bit. Stressing him out a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And then he switched to Olympic recurve and, and that didn't necessarily get any better. And then he switched to bare bow, which is what I'm shooting. And that bare bow is, is, you know, minimal equipment. All it's you, the bow, your tip of Simplistic. the arrow, put it in the middle. Yeah. And all of a sudden, we just started seeing, like, there was changes. Things were, he was just having so much more fun. We didn't see all of these, you know, you could see when he would, like, kind of space out a little bit. You could tell that there was things going on in his brain. He was having, like, and and maybe I shouldn't, he was just having a ton of seizures per day. And he got oh. to the point where things were going so well that they even, they gave, they did a ambulatory EEG. He came in here, shot with it on. And the doctors pretty much said, listen, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. That's amazing. And, and That's really cool. They even toyed around with taking them off meds, but that didn't go quite as well as they had hoped. Yeah. But they still know that it that archery produces a major benefit. chemicals that makes the body want to heal. It makes the it's it suppresses anxiety. You know, and I've often i I've said it a million times, at full draw in archery, when you're at full draw for a moment you aren't thinking about anything. Yeah. Your mind shuts off. And in weightlifting, it's the same way, especially, yeah. mid-pull. In, especially in the snatch. You aren't – in mid-pull or, in, in, or the clean, yeah. you know, really both parts, probably a clean and jerk. But there's a moment where your mind shuts off and you're just doing the thing. Yeah. Your mind shuts just off. Just a response. That's where yeah. the stress relief comes. Yeah, and that's that's the important part that we have to be thankful for. That I think. that's a flow state, you know. I I just another sport. I never really talk about it much because I always feel like people won't understand it, and I'll, I'll sound crazy. It's one of my favorite sports I've ever been, if you want to call it that. 
you know, it's, it's a competitive sport out there, but I look at it as an art form is surfing. Oh, I yes, was just yes. down in Delaware. Uh, I went down to Cape Antelope State Park. We had a big swell. It was the first time as an East Coast surfer really taking advantage. Of, I, I started surfing over on the West Coast, so I didn't really explore the beach here. And I scored. In layman's terms, that means it was about as good as it gets on the East Coast. On the East Coast. I mean, there was <laughs> six foot, seven foot barrels. Guys were getting pitted. That locals there were like, this is great. <laughs> and that part where you're paddling, you're thinking, and, it, and all things run through your mind. Like, what if I don't make this drop? All the locals are watching. If I don't make this drop, they won't let me have another wave because they'll be like, oh, screw this guy. Like, it's very territorial with surfing. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then he, he, you're about to drop in, and you're like, oh, I got to go. What if I get sucked over the falls, all this stuff? What if I hit bottom? You know, What if I fall on my head and break my neck? Because it's happened. And you make it, and you're you're taking your bottom turn through the wave, and you're making you're setting that trim line, and the wave starts pitching, the lip starts pitching, and you're in a barrel. Everything slows down. What seems to you like a whole minute is like ten seconds, ten seconds in the barrel, mm-hmm. at best. You know, maybe five. And, and everything slows down. Every little intricate piece of movement that you're doing, whether you're shifting your body weight left and right, pitching and rolling, trying to fit in that tiny little space so that you don't get dumped. Uh, it's really amazing that when we talk about that flow s- state, surfing is really intrinsic with that because it's all it's about. It's about sitting in the water, waiting for, right for, some, for the right moment to happen. You learn to read a natural phenomenon. Mm-hmm. That's happening around you, and you're writing in it, and it's pretty goddamn amazing. You know, bow hunting is a lot like that as well. Oh yeah, because okay, you have your target, but your target's a living organism, yeah, and you have to put yourself. in that It's right got its moment. own mind. It's got its own psychology behind that it, right? Time. You know, it's, yeah, it's got bow, its own behavior. Is, that's a whole again. That's a whole other oh, yeah. topic. But I mean, bow yeah. hunting is very much the same. You, you know, and then you have to get you have to you have to be efficient with your with your equipment, and you have to be you have to be in that right spot. At the right time, and then not botch the last step. The last step is taking the shot, and then, and then so here you are, full draw on a live, a live being. And, and you owe it to that live being to make to a be good, good, clean you shot. Can. Yeah. You owe it to him. That's right. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 crazy how in these in these alternate living worlds of athletics and sports, they live so parallel to each other. Oh yeah, you it's know? part of the human condition. It, it, yeah. You know, it's like why do we have so many sports? Yeah. People are like, oh, I don't really like sports. I'm like, you just haven't found one that you enjoy doing or you haven't found one that you enjoy that you'd appreciate because you don't understand it. Like, yeah. Yeah, okay, not everybody likes to watch the Super Bowl. I get it. Yeah. Nobody likes that fanfare, you know. Like, yeah, a bunch of guys hitting each other. <laughs> you know, some people like watch MMA. Some people like watching surfing, archery, tennis, whatever it is. It's part of the human condition, our psyche. Yeah. Not only do we like to be competitive with each other, that's one side of it. We like to be competitive with ourselves. Mm-hmm. You seeing a human being, someone of your species, of your race, mm-hmm. at their very peak performance, the very best of your human race. You know, like like someone like a long jumper yeah. or a high jumper. You see someone like break a world record in high jump. How about the high school kid that just ran a nine point nine? Oh my god! Foot strike. Wow. Form. Yeah. So they, who's his coach? <laughs> uh, he's gonna have some amazing coaches when he goes to college. Yeah. But, well, you know they took and this is again way off, way off topic, but he they took that they didn't give him a record because of a tailwind that was blowing at his back. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Hey, if you ran it, you ran it. <laughs> I'm sorry, but tailwind at that point when you're moving that fast, I don't know how much it really matters. He, oh, I guess he beat the record by like zero, like I don't know, not a lot. Well, he's going to break it. I'm sure he's going to break hey, it, especially it's, now. It's still the first week of May. I know. He's got a couple weeks left. Yep. Is, is he a senior? Yeah, yeah he's a yeah, senior. Yeah, he's got a couple. He's got states to go. Yeah, they call him, if white, he's they got call a, him white lightning. If, if he's peaking and tapering, he's going to hit that. That's and right. He's going to do it. That's right. Imagine that, peaking and peaking, tapering. Peaking and Periodization and archery. Crazy. Yeah. All these concepts. But, but anyway, uh, yeah, like we, 
we, we probably breached all What's your address down here? Uh, I said it earlier. It's okay. 1022 Chestnut Road um, in Orangeburg. And it's a big green round roof building. You can't miss it. We have an 80-yard outdoor range. We have a 40-yard indoor range, 3D, um, all the competition archery targets. And we actually just are working with the Orangeburg Gun Club, and we're putting in a, uh, a cool. competition 3D course as well so that um, we're going to be – hosting outdoor leagues this summer and we have we're going to be doing hosting 3d shoots outdoor 3d shoots and we got a lot of things kind of coming along the way but if you if you for the listeners of follow us at grass hollow archery on facebook um follow us at grass hollow archery i think it's it might be gh archery on instagram gha yeah yeah, gha um and and if you really want to Shoot, follow me on Instagram by all means. My, uh, is it my second, slight, slightly above average, slightly above Archer. average. Yeah. yeah, it's nice and humble. Little, I little, like it. Little play on, little yeah, play words there. It's slightly yeah. above average Archer. Um, so yeah, I just we're doing our thing, man. We're trying to create something out of nothing and make sure that the sport that I have some of my fondest memories with, my dad. Um, continues to grow in the area, and that's really, that's really how this whole thing started. It's a cool legacy. So that's what's up, guys and gals. Even if you're not into hunting, because I've heard this before, I'm not really into hunting, and I don't know about feeling about being around hunters. Okay, I get it. You're vegetarian. Maybe you're not like into that whole culture. Archery itself as a sport is pretty damn cool. You're gonna enjoy it. I, I feel like if you if you have a pulse and you come in this building and you meet Frank, you're going to have a good time. I There's gar- something got to be wrong with you if you don't have a good time. I guarantee you, <laughs> I love people saying, I can't do it. I can't do it. Listen, I've had – you can do it. I've had enough people in front of me. I've worked with enough archers and all that. I literally can find a way to get anybody to shoot. Hell yeah. Anybody. And, and you will have fun. It doesn't have to be for you. You don't have to spend a lot of money. No, but you can have fun, and and you know, I'm hoping to 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 kind of build some team building stuff and do some corporate stuff with like businesses and whatnot for their employees to to show that that archery is you get results by doing the things right here, right now. You do it, put in the work here, you get the results over there. But you worry it's a about, byproduct. You worry about doing it. It's here. like, oh, that's a nice bonus. Imagine if you take that into the business world and be like, listen, people, this is this. We need to do these things. We will get those results. Let's, do these handful of things. Do them really well. Do these for right. a while. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, yeah. hey, whoa, well, success. Yeah, success. Crazy right. byproduct. Guys, we're gonna have to leave you here pretty soon. Uh, I just want to touch base on a few things coming up. Uh, just in a couple of days, May eighteenth, Coal Region Classic. It's a sanctioned USA weightlifting meet in your own backyard in Deer Lake, Pennsylvania over at Fluid Fitness, home of Fearless Barbell. You want to see some really amazing athletes do some movements that maybe you haven't seen before? Or you maybe you just want to check out the facility. Pop in Saturday morning, 9 o'clock in the morning till about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We'll be there lifting some heavy stuff. Uh, strength and conditioning seminar, June 8th. High school coaches... Get your butts in there. I want to help you out. This is this is me just trying to share some experiences, giving you a handful of things that maybe you're doing already, but you could be doing a little better. Because majority of you, you're, you're, you're probably squatting, you're deadlifting, all that stuff. But I'm trying to give you the tools to refine it to the point where you bring your kids to the next level. Like we talked about before, if the kid gets a little extra money in his pocket for a partial scholarship to a D2 school even – because he's a little faster on his 100, it's worth it, you know? And if your kid's faster, that means my kid has to be a little faster. And it makes everybody better. That means you, they can get away from the zombies better than... <laughs> the zombies. <laughs> so next episode, May 29th, we're going to have John Zajac. John Zajac, a good friend of mine, and actually coached me in Olympic weightlifting. He's the head coach and owner of Zajac athletics down in lancaster pennsylvania you're not going to want to miss this uh it's it's gonna be a treasure show of knowledge stories uh, a little bs 
My brother's going to be on Tony Stokes, oh, nice. who is a he's a former athlete of John's. He trained John or John trained him for quite a long time. I always make fun of him. It's like his long lost brother. They never see each other anymore. <laughs> we're going to talk about that whole journey. We're going to talk about his one of his newer athletes and one of my newer intern coaches, Derek Hartmanth, who's been working for me the last couple months. Uh, he trains under John. He's a strong and, dude. He's a strong freak. I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a stronger person pound for pound in this county. Talk about somebody that enjoys the mental grind. He loves it. He lives for it. Yeah. Lives for it. That's. I love to watch that. I love to see it. I like to put a bow in his hands. <laughs> Anything he picks up. You know, it's like, I'm not good at this now, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it. It's, yeah, it's, it's that, mentality. that mentality. That's that mentality. I, I don't know the answer now, but I'm going to find it. I'm going to be a freaking master at it. And uh, we're going to have all these guys on the show. It's going to be a little crazy. But you, I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. And so am I. So I probably won't have to talk very much. <laughs> so that's where we're going to leave you guys. I hope you had a good time. I know we talked quite a bit. But hopefully there was something in there of value that you could grab and take for yourself. I'm sure there is, and we will see you in two weeks. Have a good night.